you turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 12. We're going to begin by reading the entire chapter, so stick with me. Acts chapter 12, follow along if you can. Luke writes that about that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. Just to put this in kind of its uh, timeline, if you remember last week, the church had decided, the church at Antioch had decided to send Saul and Barnabas back to the churches in Jerusalem and the surrounding area with uh, gifts, with offerings to help for this time of famine. So about that time, about the time that Saul and Barnabas were in Judea, King Herod laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread, and when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison. But earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When he had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so and kept saying, it is his angel. Or they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. And when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace, because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a god and not of a man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down, because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. It's a story of tremendous power and power conflict, isn't it? I'll never forget, it's probably, I don't know, maybe five or six. We went on a vacation to the ocean, which 
at five or six years old was a novelty because I grew up in West Virginia. Uh, so to make it to the ocean was, a, was a, a different experience for us. We took a vacation, uh, and it was to the East Coast, right, Atlantic Ocean, which is itself different from our coast, right? Uh, if you've ever been to the East Coast, and I imagine you probably have, it's a different water over there. It's a different ocean. Uh, being five or six, I remember sitting in uh, the water just kind of along the edge as the waves rolled in, and uh, my sister Jackie and I, we had our little squeaky shark toys, and we're just sitting there having a grand old time playing when all of a sudden uh, this rogue tsunami type wave uh, just rolled us over and, and up the beach. I hadn't experienced anything like that before. That was my first experience with the power of the ocean. And just this last fall, uh, we were on the, this coast, just down in St. Pete for a few days. And it was as one of the, the storms were coming through. And uh, I took our two oldest boys in the afternoon as the storm was just off the coast. And we went and waded out into the waves. Uh, we don't get that experience over here very often. But if you've been in those kind of waves where they're surging to 10 or 12 feet and you're looking up at them as they're crashing over your head, or you're diving into them, it is power. And it's a power that you're just kind of futile to resist, man. It will beat you to death. It will wear you out. The ocean is a constant reminder in that regard of our own weakness. And even in our uh, Gulf Coast, you get out sometimes and there are these currents, these riptides that just pull. And we hear news stories of people that get sucked out and worn down by the power of this water movement. And we are powerless against it no matter how hard we try and we fight and man we were in those waves and we were fighting those waves we were diving into the waves we were trying to jump over the waves but guess what in the end we had to get out of the water and the waves kept on coming that was futile to resist our power is minuscule it was nothing compared to what the ocean can bring. I think that's something of a picture of what we see laid out for us in Acts chapter 12. There is a powerful individual. His name is Herod. Now, Herod, if you've read the New Testament at all, uh, the Herod thing gets a little bit confusing, doesn't it? Uh, there are as many as six different Herods mentioned in the New Testament. This is why it's so confusing. Let me, let me just lay out for you kind of a, a brief family tree of the Herods. The reason this is so confusing is that Herod was actually the name of a royal family uh, that was uh, allowed to uh, serve as king over the region of Israel and the surrounding territories under the Caesar, who was the emperor of Rome. So Herod the Great was the first of this Herodian dynasty. He was the guy, if you remember when uh, news of Jesus' births reached his throne, he was the one that pronounced the edict that all babies, male children, two years of age and under, in the city of Bethlehem were to be put to death, right? That's Herod the Great. Well, Jesus and his family uh, flee into Egypt for a while. They escape. And during that time, Herod the Great dies. But before he dies, he decides to split up his kingdom into three parts. So one of, uh, one of his sons, three of his sons, would rule over uh, each division of this kingdom. So now you have Herod Archelaus, son of Herod the Great, who becomes ruler of Judea. He's the reason why uh, Joseph, Jesus' father, did not want to return to Bethlehem when Herod the Great died, right? Because Herod's son has taken over and he still fears uh, for Jesus' life. Herod Antipas is son number two. Uh, he rules over Galilee. He's the one that John the Baptist confronts about marrying his brother's wife, Herodias, right? He's also the one that Jesus called that fox Herod, right? That is Herod Antipas. 
And then there's Herod Philip, who he married his niece, Salome. Uh, she was the one who requested John the Baptist's head on a platter from uh, her then father, Herod Antipas. Uh, things get very confusing. There's a lot of intermarriages and people loving people and getting married who probably shouldn't have. Um, but that's, that's the Herodian dynasty, right? Um, there are others mentioned, but those are, the, those are the four most prominent. The Herod that we run into in Acts chapter 12 is neither one of those guys. He's actually Herod Agrippa I. He was the grandson of Herod the Great. But his father had been executed, right? So when he's three years old, Herod the Great has Herod Agrippa's father put to death. And so out of fear for Herod Agrippa, he is sent to Rome where he is educated uh, alongside the, the, the royal court of the Caesar himself. So he grows up with kind of this great privilege, not only being the grandson of the king and a nephew to multiple kings, but he serves in the court of the emperor of Rome himself. And there he becomes friends with a couple of classmates, one named Caligula and the other named Claudius. Both of these individuals will at some point serve as emperor of Rome. So he's going to grow up with two guys who are going to step in and become the Caesar, the Augustus, over all of the Roman Empire. That was about AD 11, all right? Fast forward about 26 years later, and Herod Agrippa is appointed king over his uncle Philip's territory. Uncle Philip passed away. He had no living heirs. And so his friend, Emperor Caligula, appoints him the king in Philip's place. Stick with me through the history here for just a second. I find this fascinating, and I think it's relevant, all right? Agrippa has an uncle. Remember, Herod Antipas. Antipas doesn't like Agrippa. Agrippa had gotten himself in a lot of debt. He hadn't been in the region of Judea for a long time. And Antipas decides, I should be king of Agrippa's territory. So he appeals to Emperor Caligula and says, this man is untrustworthy. And kind of slanders Agrippa to Caligula. Well, guess who Caligula is going to side with? Well, he's going to side with his childhood friend, right? And so he does, and he deposes Antipas and gives Antipas territory now to Agrippa. So now all of a sudden his territory has expanded. Later, the emperor passes away. Caligula is actually murdered because... He's crazy, uh, so they put him to death. Uh, Claudius, the other friend of Herod Agrippa, steps in to become emperor. And Agrippa supported his friends. There was a bit of a power struggle between the Senate and, and, and the, the, the new potential emperor, Claudius. Agrippa throws his influence behind Claudius, and, and then as a thank you, Claudius expands Agrippa's territory again. He gives him all of Judea and parts of Syria. And so now Agrippa rules over a territory roughly the same size as his grandfather, Herod the Great. I mean, all I have to say, he, he is a powerful individual. He is very well connected. And he rules over a sizable territory. He would have been one of the most influential, powerful people in the eastern half of the Roman Empire. And not only that, but during his rule, he throws his authority behind the Orthodox Jews. And so he supports their religious practices and encourages their religious practices. In other words, this guy was pretty smart. He's a pretty savvy politician. He knows what side to play, and he knows how to garner the favor of the people, people over whom he is ruling. You are Orthodox Jews. You, you have a lot of influence over this territory. That is positive for me. So let me prop you up and support you, and I will be in favor of your religious practices. And in return, you'll support my kingship and my rule. And that's exactly what he did. 
he did a fantastic job of brokering peace between the Jews and the Romans and blending the two together. So here was a man born to privilege and power with enough wisdom to use his influence to ingratiate himself both to his authorities and those under his rule. He was powerful. And he's like those waves coming into the ocean. And what, what would we, the common people, be able to do against such a power, against such an authority? With all of this power, with all of this accumulation of authority, in Acts chapter 12, Herod Agrippa I has two things, decides there are two, uh, two things, two items he would like to check off of his to-do list. One of those things is to bring an end to Christianity. Now, I don't know if this was because he particularly hated Christianity for any reason or, other, or just simply the fact that he had kind of thrown his lot in with the Orthodox Jews and he knew that they didn't like Orthodox Christianity. So to gain favor with them, I, I can just... I can persecute the Christians. That will gain me more favor with the Jews. And so in verse number 1 of chapter 12, he laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. And verses 2 and 3 make it very clear what his strategy was going to be. His strategy was not necessarily to target the people in the church. His strategy was to target the leadership of the church and to make an example of them and to put them to death. And so he goes for James, the brother of John, first. And he puts him to death. And he, and he kind of gauges, you know, you know the kind of, the kind of uh, uh, political rulers who do this, right? Like, do something, and then they kind of gauge the temperature of the room, right? Like, how did that go over? Let, let's test the waters a little bit. Oh, they liked that. Now I'm going to double down. So now he comes after Peter, right? The leader of the 12. And he imprisons Peter. He clearly wants to kill him. But he can't, because he happened to arrest Peter during the time of what's called here in chapter 12, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is just the Passover, right? And during the Passover, they were not permitted to put people to death, even if you were guilty. You had to wait until after the feast was done, after the Passover had ended. So instead of killing Peter uh, immediately, he puts him in prison to wait for the right time, to wait until he's able to put him to death. This is a different strategy. If you remember back a few uh, chapters ago, in chapter 8, it seems as if the Jewish leaders abandoned the strategy of attacking and going after the apostles. Right? You remember Gamaliel? He was like, listen, leave these guys alone because if this is of God, then we can't stop it. And if it's not of God, then it's not going to last anyway. So leave those guys alone. But then there's this persecution that, that uh, crops up and becomes very severe in chapter 8. But it says in chapter 8, verses, uh, verse 1, that all of the people scattered across the region. Like, they left Jerusalem except for the apostles. It seems as if maybe they were intimidated by the popularity of the apostles. Maybe they were intimidated by the ability of the apostles or, or the influence of the apostles or just still listening to Gamaliel's advice. Whatever the reason, it seems that they kind of left the apostles alone and they were going after the people sitting in the pews. And those people scattered. But now here's Herod, and he's going, no, no, no. We're going after the head of the hydra, right? Like, we're cutting this thing off at the head. We're going after those guys, and going after those guys is going to bring an end to this entire movement. So now James is dead, and Peter is in prison. And this action, this, this use of force, this display of power by Herod, it puts him in direct conflict with Jesus. You remember how, remember how Jesus said to Peter and to the apostles, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Herod, by his actions, has put himself in direct conflict with the king, with the king of kings. You remember how Jesus said to Saul when he confronts him on the road to Damascus, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? An attack against the church is to put oneself in direct conflict with the king. 
is not merely about the suppression of religious freedom. It's not merely about maintaining a constitutional right. It is first and foremost an assault on the king of kings himself. This is helpful for us to remember, I think. As we advocate for religious freedoms, both here in our country and abroad, it is not first and foremost about inalienable, inalienable human rights. It is first and foremost about recognizing the authority of Jesus over human authorities, including our government. That is the foundation for our belief in freedom of religion, freedom to meet and gather and worship. We ought to be staunch defenders and advocates of such freedom. But listen, as we have often been reminded in this book of Acts, the absence of such freedom does not jeopardize Jesus' rule nor the advance of his kingdom. The absence of religious freedom, or to put it in a different way, the presence of religious persecution does not jeopardize the authority or the power of Jesus, nor the advance of his church. That's goal number one of Herod. We're going to put an end to this Christian thing. Goal number two is to exalt himself. There's this interesting part of the story down in verse number 20. It says, when Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, they came to him with one accord, and they, they persuade this, um, this chamberlain of the king's court, Blastus. They asked him for peace. They needed food from Judea. They needed food from Herod. That's how they survived on this, uh, this coastal land. And so on an appointed day, Herod puts on his royal robes and takes his seat on the throne. And he speaks. He gives this speech to them. And as he speaks, the people are like, it's the voice of a god. He's not a man. It's the voice of a god. Now they were, I mean, they were, I mean, come on, right? They, they, were, they were trying to butter him up. They were trying to get back on his good graces. They wanted something from him. They were trying to appease him. So they were, they were building him up. Building him up. Josephus gives us a little bit of insight here. Josephus was the, the Jewish historian uh, from, from the first and, and early part of the second century. He writes and said that uh, there was a, the, the reason he was here in Phoenicia, there was uh, uh, games, events, like shows that were being put on in honor of Claudius, the new emperor. And so he's there, and, and Josephus writes that on the second day of these shows, he, Herod, put on a garment made holy of silver and came into the theater early in the morning, at which time the silver of his garment, being illuminated by the fresh reflection of the sun's rays upon it, shone out after a surprising manner. And it was so resplendent as to spread in horror over those that looked intently upon him. And presently, his flatterers cried out, one from one place and another from another, though not for his good, that he was a god. And they added, Be thou merciful to us, for although we have hitherto reverenced thee only as a man, Yet shall we henceforth own thee as superior to mortal nature. He's not a man, he's a God. We will now on revere you as a God, sitting there in your silver robes, reflecting the light of the sun and all of its brilliance. You can't possibly be human, Herod. You're something better than Herod. Josephus ends his, his account by saying this, Upon this, the king did neither rebuke them nor reject their impious flattery, and this to his own demise. Rather than give God the glory, Herod was quite willing to soak it all in. What a contrast. What a contrast to Peter, who just a few chapters before, when he was confronted or when he, he met with Cornelius, Cornelius, you remember, falls at Peter's feet and begins to worship him. And what did Peter say? Peter said, get up. I'm just a man like you. What a difference. Only pride in a man's heart would convince him that he is worthy to be revered as a God. And folks, this pride will run you into direct 
conflict with King Jesus. Proverbs 16, 5 says, Everyone who is arrogant in his heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, this raises a question, I think, in us, doesn't it? Why does God hate pride so much? Why? Is he so angry with our pride? Well, quite simply, folks, pride is, is kind of this heart attitude in us that says, I am God. It, it's that attitude that wants to throw off God's authority in favor of my own authority. In that regard, it is the original sin, isn't it? It was the downfall of angel and human alike. Those who said, I will be like the Most High. I will exalt my throne above God's. And those who said, it is not enough to serve under the rule of God. We would be like God. It is our attempt to play God. That's what pride is. I mean, when we look at it in a, in a story and in a character like Herod, it's just glaring, isn't it? Like, it's off-putting. We don't even like to be around people like this, do we? Who do you think you are? But I think, folks, in our moments of quiet, honest reflection, we recognize little remnants of this pride in our own heart, don't we? We want to throw off the rule of God. There are maybe these certain areas of life where we don't want Christ to have authority. We don't want to know what he says. We don't want to give in. We don't want to give up. And we resist. And we excuse our behavior. We rationalize our decision making. And it is pride to do so. The warning is clear. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. It's like these, it's like these waves are, are, are now clashing against each other, isn't it? You've got the mighty power of Herod, and he is leveling that power against the authority of King Jesus himself. What will Jesus' response be? What will he do? That's really the majority of the chapter. We are meant in this chapter, I believe, to be astounded by the power of Jesus. Power to effortlessly turn the tables on Herod. without even breaking a sweat. Herod, in all of his might, and with all of his power, with all of his influence, found it futile to fight against Jesus. What does Jesus do? Let's look. Several ways that Jesus displays his power in this chapter in, in magnificent fashion. Number one... He displays his power over Herod's prisons. Herod had killed James, put Peter in prison. He's waiting on the Passover to put an end to Peter also. He puts Peter under the guard of four squads. Uh, these are what, what, are, what are termed quaternions. They're, they're little groups of soldiers, just four soldiers to a group. And typically what would happen is, is four soldiers would be assigned to you and they would rotate through the night, taking turns through the different watches of the night. Herod assigns four squads, a total of 16 soldiers to Peter, maybe because he'd already heard of Peter's uh, ability to escape prisons, right? That's already been documented. So it's like it's not going to happen under Roman rule. It might have happened under Jewish 
you know, temple guard, but it's not going to happen under Roman rule and certainly not on my watch. And so here's 16 people. Two of them stayed in the cell with Peter, chained to him. Two of them stood guard outside, and they rotated through the night. Peter was under heavy security. It says in verse 6 that he was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and centuries before the door were guarding the prison. What a display of power, right? What a display of power over Peter. Peter, I can put you to death. I can imprison you. There's nothing you can do about it. He wanted Peter dead. And yet what does Jesus do? He sends an angel and just walks Peter out. Just exits. He has power, folks, to set prisoners free. He has power to set prisoners free. I love the interaction between Peter and the angel, by the way. There's a lot of humor interwoven into this story as, as Luke recounts it for us. You know, Peter is fast asleep, which we'll talk about in just a minute, but the angel shows up, and Peter is so asleep that the angel has to hit him on the side. Get up! Right? It kind of reminds me, this whole account of Peter and following the angel kind of reminds me, like, in the back of my mind, I've got a Christmas carol. You know, there's a dude, thinks he's in a dream, being led around by these otherworldly spirits. Here's Peter, thinks he's in a dream, being led around by an angel. But folks, when this angel shows up, the, the chains just, I mean, they just, they just fall off. The, the prison door, it, it's, like, it's like a mirage. They get to the iron gate, and it just swings open. And Peter is like, this is surely a dream. But it wasn't a dream was the power of the king to rescue his people from their prison. Folks, this is exactly how salvation operates. And we praise God for that. John chapter 8, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin, bound just as Peter was bound in that prison, incapable of our own escape, incapable of, uh, of finding freedom. You are a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the power of the king, the power of the son to set free prisoners. And though Peter thought he was walking in a dream, he soon realized that it was the power of God that set him free. Herod was not strong enough to keep him there, and Peter was not strong enough to free himself. The fact that, Jay, or that Luke recounts that Peter thought it was a dream, I think part of the reason he does that is to help remind us that it was not Peter's power or ability, you know, like ninja-like reflexes that were able to get him out of the prison. Peter didn't even know what was going on. Peter thought he was dreaming. It was God who opened the doors and caused the chains to fall off. And folks, you have no more ability to free yourself from sin and judgment than Peter had to save himself from the clutches of King Herod. Peter was powerless in bondage, in jail, nothing he could do. And apart from Christ... We are bound to our sin, helpless and hopeless in our condition. Folks, salvation comes by God's grace through faith, not by any works which we have done or can do or will do. It is God who delivers. It is the power to set prisoners free. He also has the power to bring peace in some really unpeaceful circumstances. You read that, doesn't it strike you that Peter's just asleep? I, 
if it were me, and I'm, I'm chained between two guards, and I'm, I'm probably sleeping on a hard floor, and it's probably cold, and I don't even have my cloak to cover up with to use as a blanket, and, and I gotta lay there and try to sleep knowing that the next morning I'm gonna be put on some monkey trial and put to death. I don't know how much sleeping I'm doing. But Peter is out cold. Why? How could he possibly sleep at a time like how so asleep that an angel appears, which is usually like an astonishing that gets your attention kind of sight in the New Testament? And the angel has to strike Peter. Hey, Peter, get up, man. Put your clothes on. Let's go. What power on earth could possibly give such peace to someone in such unpeaceful circumstances? We go back to the words of Jesus again in John 14, 27. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. See, those who know the king, those who are rightly related to him, have his peace. The same peace that permitted him to sleep in the bottom of a boat that was about to sink. 2 Thessalonians 3.16 says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. At all times and in every way. In other words, there is never a circumstance in this life where the peace of God is not able to rule in your hearts. There is nothing that could possibly happen in this world that could ever separate you from the gift of God's peace, a powerful peace. What a demonstration of the power of the king, even in a very dark place, to give peace to his people. And maybe you're searching for peace this morning. And maybe you've been looking all over the place and you've tried all kinds of different avenues. And folks, understand peace comes when you lay down your weapons and fall at the feet of the true king who makes peace with you and God by his own blood. That's Romans 5.1, right? Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He has the power to bring peace, the power to set prisoners free. And this one I think is really interesting, and it's becoming very obvious to me. We're only going to make it halfway through this chapter. So you're looking at the rest of this going, all right, we're going we're to stop soon, I promise. But this third, this third point is really fascinating to me because, and, and, I, and I phrased it this way. He, Jesus, has the power to move his people to pray. He has the power to move his people to pray. Look back at verse number five. It says, so Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. In verse number 12, when he, Peter, realized this, he realized he's free, it's not a dream, he goes to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. Now, what's going on here? Right, one of the questions I think we're, we're, we have to ask, or if you're reading, like I know I asked, was why does Peter get all this prayer and James doesn't? Right? Why, why does James' life get taken and Peter gets put in prison and all of this prayer for Peter and he ultimately gets released? Why doesn't James get the same amount of attention? Why doesn't he get the same amount of prayer? And there are some people that try to point out to these verses and, and credit the church for Peter's deliverance. They like, see, if only the church had prayed for James the same way they prayed for Peter, then James would have been delivered just like Peter. And there's this subtle notion there that in some way our praying controls the hand of God. What's actually going on here? I think it's, it's more likely, for both theological and practical reasons, that James doesn't get the same amount of prayer because there was not time. I mean, you read, he arrests Peter and wants to put him to death, but he can't. 
He has to wait. He has to put Peter in prison. He arrests James, doesn't have to wait, right? There's no Passover. He just, he just goes through the process. So chances are there was no time for the church to gather and for these prayer meetings to be had while Peter, there are people praying all the time. Apparently night and day they're gathering in this place and they are praying. And when they go home, they pray and, and they come together and they pray. And, and they're just praying for Peter for days during the Passover. And folks, I think... I I think my logic is tight here. I I think I'm okay in saying that if we credit the church for Peter's deliverance, then the church would also bear the blame for James' death, right? Well, what's actually going on here? I want to read Matthew Henry um, on on this point because I think he's, he's really good and I couldn't improve on this, right? Here's what Matthew Henry says about this passage. God so ordering it that they should not have space to pray for James. When he designed, they should not have the thing they prayed for. Right? What does that mean? It means God didn't even give them the opportunity to pray when he did not intend to answer that prayer in the first place. James must be offered upon the sacrifice and service of their faith and therefore prayer for him is restrained and prevented. Now this leads obviously to another point about Jesus' power that we're not going to have time to, to, to cover this morning, and that is Jesus' power is beyond our comprehension, right? Because this, this just leads us, why would Jesus make this decision? Why would he allow James to be put to death and Peter to be freed? I don't know. I, I don't know. What I do know is that the sovereign authority of Jesus extends to the death of his people, and that sovereign authority is always good. It is always good, and it is always wise, and it is always right. Let's come back to the idea of prayer here for just a second. Matthew Henry concludes the statement with this, but Peter must be continued to them. And therefore, prayer for him is stirred up, and time is given them for it. It is not the sovereign good will of the king for Peter to die at this point in history. And so he motivates the church to pray, which probably didn't take a lot of motivation. They loved Peter. They wanted to pray for Peter. But he also provides the time to do so. Folks, we tend to look at prayer as our attempt to move God to do something that he is either reluctant or unwilling to do. Like we're trying to convince him. But the Bible gives us a very different idea of what prayer is. The Bible presents prayer as operating within the confines of sovereignty and not outside of it. And I can't begin to explain how all of that works together, okay? Okay. Why would God engage us in prayer? The best answer I can give you for that is that God loves us. And he loves to hear our prayers and he loves to give answer to those prayers. So in that regard, think of the graciousness of God here. He loves to answer the prayers of his people, but it is not his sovereign will that James should live. It is his sovereign will that James should die, but the will of his people would have been that James would live. That is what they would have wanted. And so he just doesn't even give them the opportunity to pray. I'm taking James. He's coming home. Folks, this means encouragement for our praying. I know people look at this and they talk about the sovereignty of God over, and they're like, well, why do we even pray then to begin with? We pray with the encouragement that God is sovereign, even over our praying. Why would the Lord? So we pray. By the way, and much of our prayers require us to say things like, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Why? Because God is sovereign over the affairs of men. And God is sovereign even over our praying. 
And so why would the Lord teach us by example to pray this way when it comes to our circumstances? The reason is because we don't know what God may want. And so we pray with confidence, always resting in the sovereignty of God, knowing that our prayers matter and knowing ultimately that God knows and will do what is best. And so if God has granted you the space and time to pray, then do not waste that time and space. You have the opportunity to participate in sovereign matters of the kingdom of God, even though you may not be certain how things are going to turn out. Pray. Pray with confidence. But pray trusting that the power of Christ rules over your praying. Folks, this power is beginning to become clear. Herod's authority, Herod's power is no match. He locks Peter down. Jesus just has him walk out. He tries to put Peter in a position of hopelessness. And Jesus gives him peace. He tries to destroy the church. Jesus stirs up his church to pray. He kills James. And Jesus says, only by my will. We get ourselves in positions sometimes where it feels like the powers of this world are washing over us like those waves on the seashore and we are powerless to resist. Sometimes it feels as if temptation will just sweep us off our feet and we are powerless to resist. But folks, the statement is true. The truth is real. That greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And it's not even close. The nations are like a drop in the bucket. He laughs at their attempts to throw off his authority. And his power is for us. It is for us. It resides in us. Which ought to give us Great encouragement. It also calls us to submission and humility, doesn't it? To willingly bow to this king. Because it is ultimately futile. And as we'll see next time, dangerous to resist such a power as his. Let's pray. Lord.